So again, welcome everyone to another Emancipatory Education Speaker Series event sponsored by the SJSU Connie O'Leary College of Education and Division of Student Affairs. My name is Brian. I'm just here to orient you to the space today and let you all know that a recording of this event will be available afterward at the URL that's listed there. That's the same one that you registered for this event on. So we have all the recordings there for all the previous speaker series events as well. And I'll drop that in the chat in a moment. Captions are available in this Zoom webinar today. So you can select the captioning option in the bottom of your Zoom toolbar to do that. Um, those of you who are attending the webinar today, your video and audio are automatically turned off. So you don't have to worry about being visible in today's event, but please use the chat to communicate with one another and communicate with our panelists. And then our speakers will answer questions after their remarks. So now I'm gonna pass the microphone over to our Dean, Heather Latimer. Great, thank you so much, Brian. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. We are really excited to be able to have our third in a series of emancipatory education speakers in our, in our series about uh, emancipatory education with the speakers uh, for today who include uh, Dr. Tara Yoso, and we'll start off with a Latinas Leading Schools panel. Um, for those who aren't familiar, our College of Education is located at San Jose State. We have about 2,000 students, about 1,000 undergrads and 1,000 graduate students. And a few years ago, we took it upon ourselves to, to think about who we are and go through a, a strategic planning process. And this is the statement that we developed as part of that process. Uh, uh, we are committed to preparing transformative educators, counselors, therapists, school and community leaders using an emancipatory approach. And that word emancipatory is something that we've been really interrogating. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? What does that mean in terms of our engagement with the larger community over the last couple of years? And this speaker series is in part to respond to that internal question, but it's also a larger question that we're all needing to think about as we come back from uh, COVID. Uh, uh, because we know that, that while there's a great eagerness and a hunger, I think all of us are eager to get out of Zoom boxes, that saying we're coming back and we're going back to normal isn't okay because normal didn't work for too many of our families, too many of our children, too many of our communities. And so when we think about coming back from COVID, what do we want to come back to? And this really is designed, this series is designed as an opportunity to interrogate that question and to, to listen to and learn from and be in conversation with people who are leading thinkers. Uh, um, so it includes some nationally recognized policymakers. It includes uh, um, community activists. It includes leading scholars, emerging voices, uh, practitioners, and thought leaders. And, and we're really delighted to have two incredible opportunities, one a panel and one an individual speaker to listen to and learn from today. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over. Oh, sorry. One more thought. Uh, um, so as Brian mentioned, there are two series that we've already had. The first was with Gloria Ladson Billings and Jonathan Rosa. They were fantastic. Would really encourage you to uh, have an opportunity to go back to the URL that's listed there and listen in on their speaking uh, uh, and, and engagements, because I think there's there's a ton that's there to, to chew on and to learn from. And then similarly, last Friday, we were fortunate to be joined by Secretary John King and, and Dr. Leslie Gonzalez also who brought just a real wealth of knowledge and understanding to this larger question and approaching it from different angles. So from K-12, as well as higher education, from the community engaged angle, as well as from people who are deep in the work in schools. And then next week is our last in this series. We'll have Dr. EJR David and a disability justice panel that we're also really excited to engage with. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, uh, Jackie Medina, who's gonna introduce our first panel. Uh, Jackie is an EDD student here at the Lurie College of Education and is also the principal of Starlight Elementary in Watsonville. Thanks so much, Jackie. Yes, thank you. Well, welcome and good afternoon. Welcome to the Latinas Leading Schools Practica. This is, um, I have the great honor of co-moderating this Practica today. It's a discussion among some incredible leading Latinas who will introduce themselves now. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me and inviting me. My name is Fabiola Bagula. I'm the Senior Director of the Equity Department for San Diego County Office of Education. So we're responsible for leading professional learning and change both systemically and in the classroom in issues of equity with 42 school districts. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, for those of you on the East Coast, I'm Rebecca Burciaga. I am an Associate Professor uh, and Interim Chair of Educational Leadership and a Joint Appointment in Chicana and Chicano Studies. Welcome. Buenas tardes, I'm Melissa Martinez. I'm an Associate Professor in the College of Education at Texas State University, specifically in the Department of Counseling, Leadership, Adult Education, and School Psychology. And I specifically teach in the Master's in Educational Leadership and the PhD in School Improvement Programs. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, all over again. Hi, everybody. I'm Sylvia Mendez Morse. Uh, that's my short name. My long name is Sylvia Esther Mendez Morse. Because uh, that is something like that. And yeah, sorry. Now I got nervous because I know that people can hear me. I am a professor emeritus from Texas Tech University. I was with Texas Tech University for about 18 years, working in the College of Education in the Educational Leadership Department. I worked at the master's level and at the doctor's doctoral level. Thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. My name is Ana Tavares. I'm an elementary superintendent in Boston Public Schools. Very excited to be part of this platica. And I'm also a second year doctoral student at Boston College. I'm gonna go ahead and get the conversation started providing a quick overview about this book. And the book is uh, something that uh, Melissa and I uh, dreamt about and decided to do and now it has come to fruition. It is the very first book that focuses entirely on Latinas educational leaders, Latinas at the school, campus level, school level, the district level, superintendency level, and even uh, about a Latina at the, at the school board membership level. So it is a pretty unique book in not only in that it is a Latina focus and that it's also only Latina, but that it is a far ranging uh, roles of leadership roles that Latinas are in as uh, educators. Uh, Melissa, would you, what would you like to add to that? Sure, yeah, I think we were very purposeful um, in being inclusive of our understanding of, of Latinas and, and the diversity uh, among us, right? And so we were, we were super excited to be able to include uh, 10 chapters from, uh, as Sylvia mentioned, about Latinas um, that, that have different roles in K-12 education as leaders, but also from Latinas as scholars who contributed. So we have definitely practitioners, we have early career scholars, and we also have some established scholars that contributed to the book. And then um, a range of focus of uh, Latinas as, um, as participants and, and as we discuss them, differences based on nativity, um, geography. Um, so it's really a, a wonderful collection of 10 chapters. Um, and we also, another purposeful, um, focus of the book is that Sylvia and I realized that um, while there really is a dearth of, of work that looks at specifically the work of Latina school leaders is that there has been an increase in dissertations written about and by um, Latinas or, and Latinos about um, Latina school leadership, though those dissertations never really get um, published um, more officially in, in, in uh, scholarly articles. And so we really wanted to take the opportunity to invite um, Latinas and, and those who've written about Latina school leaders to do that. And so we were happy to be able to, to, to have that book to fruition as, as Sylvia said, it's been a, a labor of love. I think I'm you're sorry, muted, Sylvia. Sylvia. I'm so sorry. Uh, another, uh, unique aspect about the book that is uh, uncommon in other books about uh, school leaders is that uh, we really wanted to have it be a, um, not 
a, a book about presenting research and authentic information from practitioners and scholars, but we wanted it to have some aspect of creativity. So we have uh, not all the chapters run are, are in the very traditional uh, structure. We have chapters that are, we have one chapter that is about of uh, three Latinas, Afro-Latinas talking about their lives and in, in their jobs as if they were sitting around a kitchen table drinking coffee. So there is uh, a lot of creativity and innovation in the book as well, a lot, as, well as quite a bit of rigorous good research to be uh, that is shared with the world. And just one final um, thing I want to just mention about the book is that I think it's a perfect, the fact that we are here um, in this panel presenting right before Dr. Yasso is a perfect segue because um, without um, them knowing the contributors, not all the contributors to the chapters knew each other prior to um, contributing to the book and being a part of it, but all of them really um, pulled heavily from critical theory and frameworks and epistemologies. And um, Dr. Yasso's work on community cultural wealth really was um, integral in a lot of, um, of the chapters truly. So I think that's gonna be a perfect um, segue. Great, thank you so much. So we've had the benefit of kind of planning the session, which has been like little mini sessions. And so we began with a discussion around uh, what education should look like post COVID and, and how do we get there. Uh, but then we started really delving into uh, looking at school closures and school reopenings and closing and reopening and, and in particular what that looks like uh, in many of the communities uh, that, that you work in. Um, and so our first question is how has being online shifted connections and collaborations in the communities that you work with? I have actually found, I was very nervous about that because especially when we're having discussions about issues of equity, um, we really wanna make sure that we're able to see people's reaction and then also take care of them, right? Like maybe we trigger certain things. And so we wanted to really make sure that we're there but we have actually found that we, it is possible to hold a healing dialogue via Zoom. Um, and we've begun really um, creative about how we do that. I mean, we literally say, okay, we're gonna hold hands right now um, and, and really come together and pose those difficult questions and get into small groups and larger groups. And so we've been really happily surprised because we, we were very hesitant, especially right at the beginning of COVID with um, Arma, Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, there was a lot of need to come together for healing. Um, there was also a need to have discussions across race. Um, back when we were thinking about, I mean, I'm just gonna share with you, back when Black Lives Matter was being protested and my, my nieces and my daughter were out protesting and my mom calls and says, why are they there? It's not our fight. So I'm like, oh, we need to talk. So even within our own community, we had to have some healing dialogues and we did that um, virtually. So even though that, it shifted going online, the space was still necessary for us to come together um, for healing and for conversation. And, and I would add to um, Fabiola's focus on healing, just thinking about at the school level, how we are able to almost be in folks' homes, that the interaction within school and, and home is literally through the screen and in and, and folks' living rooms and bedrooms and, and, and kitchen tables. And that connection between the school and the community has been an opportunity for additional bonding and really um, that cultural responsiveness that, that many of the teachers are able to, to have with families at a warp speed where it may take a, a full school year or more to really get to know a family, que si la prima and this and that one. Now at this point, the prima and everyone else is part of the learning of the child that's in front of them on the screen. So it's really been an incredible opportunity to just be in comunidad in a very deep way and in a fast way. Yeah, 
Yeah, I could um, piggyback on that. And what I'm seeing as a principal of an elementary school is that the school is really transformed into like a center of the community. It's a, a place where families are coming to get up to date information, whether it's on health or resources such as housing or food or testing or where to go, mental health. Um, and so, you know, that 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 connection has really um, strengthened in many ways that we we have the resources we want to provide and we have the community that wants to, you know, it's a reciprocal relationship that's been really, um, really enhanced during this strange environment. <laughs> and, um, and also the online opportunity does provide more opportunity for families connecting some of our, um, our parent meetings are 100 plus um, participants, which we never saw that before. We thought 30, 40 was really good. And so there's something to that, that I think as a um, leader of a school that I need to look forward and, you know, in looking into the future of how to maintain that, that strong connection. We're, we're yearning for connection, I think. Sorry. The connection piece has me thinking a lot around um, you know, in one of our discussions in preparation, we talked about these communities of care and in particular um, how we see this community of care being played out among the primary caregivers for distance learning, right? Sort of who cares for the caregivers and how have you negotiated that um, community care? One of the things I wanted to bring up that that uh, the what uh, Anna and Jackie and Fabiola and Rebecca have just stated was in in the book. That's one of the uh, things that I noticed, and I think uh, Melissa and I both noticed was that um, throughout the book and throughout the stories, regardless of what what the stories were about, what the chapters were about specifically, one of the things is that Latinas have always been, always have been having to face a, a, a multitude of challenges that are not typically faced by other principles, especially white male principles and other white and other white female principles, because of the challenges that they face by of being a Latina. So there's you know ethnic dis discrimination, racism, and all of that, as well as the sexism that that many uh, women face, and of course they would what we find is that what we found is that uh, the reliance or the ability the, the ability of being bilingual has really jumped to the forefront of them uh, being able to communicate really well with with the with the, the whole community as well as the the recognition because of themselves having a cultural background that is very similar to the the population that they're serving then the being, uh, you know, having a tia show up or, or, you know, or a grandmother show up, when abuela show up on, on the Zoom meeting is not anything unexpected or not recognized as something uh, important and critical and part of that, that child's learning environment. Uh, Rebecca, your, your question. So yes to um, Silvia, to the whoever shows up, shows up, right? In comunidad, everybody shows up. And also, you both made me think of when we think about the caregivers and who's taking care of the folks that are taking care of our community. I think about even this, this community, right? Um, when I think about joining together with other Latinas and other Latina school leaders or district leaders and, and scholars and, and folks that are really thinking about this work deeply within their own community. And then within my own work, thinking about the ways in which we build community among each other and with each other and to support one another, that that's something that during this, and I love the way Jackie said these very strange times, um, that definitely the ways in which we connect um, when I think about all the time that we've had together as a comunidad, like how would we have flown to each other's places and, and done the things that we've done in the different platicas that we've had in, in even um, discussing the book or the work of the book, we've been able to say, hey, on Tuesday, 
at six o'clock, we're gonna, you know, get together and, and, and talk and chat. And, and that's something that I, we always had conference calls and we always had this ability to Zoom, but we never really took advantage of it in the way that we are now. And I think that's part of the taking care of each other and of one another. And it's, it's interesting because I see it at the community level. So I, I know Jackie, you mentioned families, but in a way it, it families coming together, like the hundred that showed up to your community meeting that would have been 30 or 40, that there's, there's a real strength in that, in the ability of there are no barriers for us to come together, which is a really interesting thing of this time too. And the, the, so one of the very popular books that's out there right now, right, is, is Untamed. Um, and I know I've been recommended to read it and I, and I read it and, and I wanted more. I wanted, I wanted my chicken soup for the Latina soul. Like I wanted my albondigas, my conchitas con atole, not, you know, I wanted something like that. And then this space has really been provided just in the community that we're building, but also in the schools that we serve. And it was very apparent by all of the authors' experiences as Latinas leading schools that we build strong communities. That part of our skill set of being a Latina leader is building those really strong communities. And I'm thinking the last time we, we talked, we were discussing this notion of students returning to school and thinking about, well, returning to school building, not returning to school because they've been learning, um, but really thinking about what might be a ritual, a healing ritual that we all kind of step in. What might we design for our communities as they re-engage with us at the school building? And how might we attend to healing and ritual? And so there was ideas that we posed around, what if we, what if we give everyone a little heart and they, and they write just the loss and we fold it and we have you know, a little bit of time um, of silence to honor the loss and then somehow hold it in some sort of um, bulletin board, but really just paying attention to it. We don't, we don't shy away from those types of spaces. We actually lean into them because it's a very real way that we take care not only of ourselves, but of our community. And, and I've seen that shine through with all of our leadership. You know, that brings us um, me to another question um, around loss. Um, and that's something that we talked about. Um, and just in general, everything that our communities, our students have gone through, what can we learn from our students' experiences? We spend a lot of time, right, in administration, uh, leadership prep programs, just preparing, but how, how do we listen to our students? I have literally been listening to them. <laughs> so I've, I've been holding a lot of student experience panels and I actually have one coming up next week. It's free, I'll, I'll post it on my Twitter. Um, and um, the questions that I'm posing to them is what, you know, what it has been your experience through COVID and distance learning. And the really funny thing is I am, they're Latino students in, in San Diego and I wanted to get across cross experience from charter school to public school to private and then also across the geographic region. And I was only gonna select four of them. Well, when I asked them, all of them had the same answer, which was, oh yeah, we have things to tell you adults and can I bring a friend? So the panel immediately got bigger and I thought, well, just like this, right? When we go to Quinceanera, we bring our primo, they brought their friend um, and we had a practice session and the range of experiences that they're saying, like there was a young lady that said, my parents lost their jobs. I am now working two part-time jobs. So whether you open or not, I need to know ahead of time because I need to give a two weeks notice. We need to make some financial decisions around me not being able to work anymore. Um, so there's some very real things that our families are experiencing. And so it would behoove us to truly listen to our students. When I, when I think about loss, um, I, I think about the losses of loved ones as well during the pandemic and how children have been able to express that in a very different way because you're literally facing each other in this environment of a screen. And um, it's much more difficult to hide the pain. And in a way that's, even though that's a challenge, it's also a gift for the practitioner that knows how to, um, not only engage, but find supports for students and for their families. And um, I really appreciate how Jackie mentioned, it almost becomes like a community hub, the school, where a one-stop shop. Um, and when you think about, you know, transformative and, and, and um, that teaching is beyond just the, 
you know, traditional pedagogy, but it's, it's, you know, how do you also transform within communities and transformation is such an important part of it all. And how do we become healers within our own community? Like that's part of our Latinidad too, that we, we our grandmothers, our abuelas, our tias were healers. And, and in some ways, and I can't, like I, I get nervous saying it because I feel like I'm nowhere near my abuela or my tias, but that in some ways this work and this vocation makes us healers as well. Um, and I say that very shyly, but I, I, I recognize it more now than ever as students approach us and, and talk about the pain that they are going through and, and how do we help them go through that and, and arrive at the other side of it and really, um, really thrive instead of just striving to, to survive. I didn't know if Jackie was gonna say something, but I wanted to, if I could, uh, just a little bit, because I kept thinking, connecting to um, your question, Rebecca, that you posed before about, um, you know, caring for the caregivers, but then also relating to this question um, and the loss. And I think about my role as a faculty who are working with the teachers who are trying to heal, right? Um, and especially our, our BIPOC teachers and staff, right? And um, how I had to, I feel like I always try to create a, a caring, inclusive community, but um, realizing that there was multiple pandemics that we've all been facing, right? Um, and how some of our um, teachers and leaders of color in particular, especially with the, um, you know, unrest and anti-black, you know, sentiments on top of and on top of um, the COVID pandemic, um, really, I found that, that there was a lot of need to heal the healers <laughs> and support them in the work that they're doing. Um, and in many, many ways, um, I remember over the summer having, you know, folks who had to keep their their video off because there was, you know, emo just raw emotions that were um, that were, that they felt they needed to 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 have, and you know, and um, yeah. So I mean, they're dealing with loss too. I've had folks who lost family members, lost best friends to COVID, but then also dealing with the multiple layers of um, of the pandemic. So I just wanted to bring that up, right? This idea of like one is like connect, but I also think there's a an opportunity especially when we consider the assets that Latina school leaders and, and BIPOC um, communities bring as educators in that role of like a community, building community and, and drawing on our assets with that. And then finding a way to connect with the communities that we serve and realizing that there's shared loss in many ways. So. Yeah, when I'm when I'm thinking about uh, who do I see on the screen supporting our youngest students and uh, you know it's disproportionately we all know women are disproportionately affected by this uh, this role, but um, I do want to share some a little story that we we recently uh, did at my school um, we're noticing the the abuelitas the super abuelitas and the super grandpas and their you know their their effort in making this whole uh, school closure happen has been incredible and so just to share a short story um, I had a grandma in the beginning of the year August tell me you know my daughter said I need to get my grandson on and and I'm gonna learn how to do it. And she's like old school Mexico, like she doesn't know how to use a Chromebook. And, and I said, well, you know, maybe there's an alternative. We can maybe find a safe space and there's a childcare. She said, no, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And so, you know, I'd walk her through it. And then the next day, you know, all these funny things with the video and the new and stuff like that would happen. And, you know, it, it wasn't working and she'd come back and the perseverance through this grandma was like, incredible and I just started noticing like my own office manager her grandma's helping her daughter and just I'm looking around like these are incredible efforts and incredible times and so we just did a little campaign called the uh, super abuelitas and the super uh, grandparents where we gave out capes to all of the um, grandmas and grandpas that are helping the kids at home and so I thought I would just share that like it's it's real and it's it's hard and there's just like real 
committed people to their family that, you know, the extended family that's making this happen. And um, yeah, so we, we decided to celebrate it in a kind of a fun way. <laughs> Jackie, I'm gonna sign up for some capes for my my parents, please. Yeah, my my the abuela and abuelo in my house. There's no way I could do this online learning for my own children without that generation helping me too. And sometimes we don't talk about that within our own lives as professional women. How do we create families and do this work and serve our community at the same time? So I love that idea of celebrating the generation that really supports us, and and thinking about all of the the extended family in, within our communities and, and our BIPOC communities that really support our, our children. And even the neighbors, like sometimes it's become, like you, you become a pod with your neighbor because if you don't have an abuela and abuelo, you, you adopt the next door neighbor, abuela and abuelo, right? So it's this way of, of really relying on our, our, our community wealth um, to really be able to access the learning because dang on it, not even a pandemic is gonna stop that abuela from teaching, right? <laughs> And that's actually what I was going to say, like a shout out to Dr. Yoso, because just even in, in what we were just talking about, um, I heard resistance capital, familial capital, aspirational capital, you know, all of those things in motion and that are beautiful about our, our, our Latina family. So beautiful. So this is um, part one. <laughs> We have to uh, transition in or we get to transition into questions uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Jackie. Yeah, so one of the questions that came in um, earlier is how do teachers continue to support a community cultural wealth model and resist Eurocentric your curriculum and leadership practices? I immediately want to say, well, you get a little bit of good trouble, right? Um, because it's necessary. And so um, I do think that, that 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 level of commitment is necessary just to move forward and do the best decisions for the children, um, because it, it, we have to stand in the face of that, of the representation, not only of um, in, in the curriculum, but also with uh, the positions that we have. Um, it's good for us to be represent, to see the kids um, and give them the representation and the honor um, that they that they are seeking. And I'm thinking about, again, like I said, I, I've been hosting student panels and one of my favorite things that students, Latino students said is, can you teach us about our good contributions? Like, I know we were migrant workers, but we've done more, no? Like, haven't we know, like contributed more than that? And so it's like, yes, we have, and we can. And so I love that push, even from students themselves of the only story, the narrative that exists for us in curriculum has been one, um, one voice. And so we, we actually, we honored migrant and then there's many others, so. I keep thinking about the stories within our own communities. And I love that question about how do we begin that? And, and Fabiola, your reminder of beginning with the wealth within our own com comunidades. Really, when I think about some of the teachers that um, just blow me away in the classrooms and observations that I, I do, it, they, they begin with, with the localized story of, of the, the the, the, the real labor of our comunidad and how they built the community, like, like as local as from where, you're, from where you are and what has been the contribution of our own community within the community, and then go from the local into the global. And, and those are the lessons that, that you know, children can really start to connect with and, and feel real pride about who, who they are and, and, and what their backgrounds are. And, and I love this reminder of one of the um, folks that are listening about just a, a shout out to siblings that are also supporting their, their younger um, siblings, that it's the tias, abuelos, abuelas, and siblings, and primos, and primas, like it's the, the entire, I, I, I think that's really critical for us to also um, mention the youth that are helping within their own, I wouldn't even say it next generation, it's like it could be even two years apart and they're helping their siblings with their homework and their work too. Okay, well, thank you. And there's um, one more question that came through that I want to share. Um, what can teacher preparation programs, school districts, and community partners do to recruit more Latinx teacher candidates? What can we do? I'll start a little uh, boldly and just say that um, in a moment, we'll talk a little bit more about the Emancipatory School Leadership 
uh, program um, that we developed. Um, and in particular, just the kind of content that we have put into that program to be more critical. Fabiola is our current amazing um, faculty member teaching our cohort uh, through a living case study. Um, so it's really taking a, a critical look at the curriculum that we're offering. Uh, it's one of those, if you build it, they will come. It was de uh, designed as a, uh, you know, in tandem with a credential, an administrative credential. But what I'm actually finding in recruitment is that not just um, those who are interested in becoming uh, positional leaders, right? So um, principals, for example, um, people are also interested in, in developing leadership skills uh, that extend into uh, teacher leadership, curricular leadership. And I don't know, Fabiola, you want to say anything? About that? Well, I think that that's a necessary um, mind frame. Like when we talk about leadership, it's not just positional or authority. I mean, I think that that's very clear from, from the book too, um, where it's whatever avenue that we're in. As Latinas, we're going to lead for the, you know, for the sake of and service of our community, and so I think it's a really beautiful way to say no. It's it is about leadership, and it but it, you don't you can come in from different avenues. You can be a counselor um, in the school system and still have an impact and change and, and and lead through some very complex pieces. And so I appreciate the larger invitation um, for that. Um, I know that I'm myself down in San Diego recruiting for admin, for an admin program for people. And what I say, actually I did it today, when I was talking to superintendents, I said, as a first generation Latina, I just wanted to be a teacher. Like I, I, I love my teachers growing up. That was the role model who I had growing up of a sal salaried career. And so I wanted to walk in their footsteps. I had no expectation of becoming a principal or an assistant superintendent or anything like that. But what I did, what I appreciated is that I had other Latinas, I had other leaders that would see me and say, you would make a great leader. Here's an opportunity to, to come to this free program or come to this meeting. And it was other Latinas kind of paving the way for me. And so I'm trying to do the same thing with our young people with the, the younger people that are exploring the notions of leadership and exploring education as a field, it's like, yes, you can and you should. And, and you know, how can we help not only mentor and coach, but also sponsor and, and really provide this avenue for other Latinas to enter into these programs? Um, because our children before us, the population is very different of the students in front of us in the school systems. And so we need to see more representation as well in the leadership positions. I really appreciate how um, Rebecca and Fabiola, you both mentioned this multi-tiered um, approach where Rebecca, you really talk about what are the offerings within um, teacher preparation courses, which is really critical. So having those conversations with the partner universities around districts, um, I know that um, as, a, as, a, as a former principal and currently as a school superintendent, that's something that we hold the institutions accountable for? Like, who are you recruiting to come into your um, school preparation programs? Because if they're not bilingual, I, I can't really use them in my school. Um, and, and just a, a reminder to folks who may not know, um, I was a principal of a dual language school. So for, for me, it was really critical to find folks that had that, that specific um, ability to connect with the community and with, and with the, um, with the curriculum as well. So, so recruiting, you know, Latinx and bilingual folk was a requirement for to be able to, to build staff capacity. And then, you know, there's the teacher prep programs that you have to hold accountable. And then what's happening at the community level, which is what Fabiola, you were talking about at the community level, there has to be an expectation around mentoring that is really critical and mentoring at all levels, right? So students mentoring students. And, 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 you know, whether you come in as a counselor, as a teacher, as an assistant teacher, like at all these different levels, there are different ways in which we can connect with each other. And, and, and I love this idea of there's so many ways to enter this work, even within the field of education, 
there's teaching, there's counseling, there's a school psychologist, there's principal, there's assistant principal. There's so many ways that are super critical and important and schools can't run with all, without all of these different positions working in, in, in unison with one another. So how do we expose children to different ways of, of thinking about leadership and leadership can come from so many different um, opportunities within this field and then also connect it to so many other fields as well. So powerful. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to give um, Melissa and Silvia uh, some time to maybe wrap up some final with some final thoughts about bring it back to the book. I'll let Sylvia go. Sylvia, you're on mute. <laughs> there I go. Uh, I wanted to make an observation, and that is that. Um, all the preparations, all the meetings that we've had to prepare for this panel presentation. And uh, and then also the work that we that that was done on on the book, in the book, for the book. I've just noticed that it um, that concept, that wonderful, powerful concept that you also gives us as co of co uh, community cultural wealth, that uh, it seems like I don't know if this is true or not, but this is what I'm, I'm observing. It's like we finally get to claim all of those things because I have, we have a label for them. And it's like, yeah, you know, we know how to do it. Uh, our grandmothers taught us how to do it, you know, and, and you know, I'm really, really good at this and I'm really good at that. And now we have that. And, and this is like the first time I think that I see, I hear us being very fluent in the language of cultural community wealth and all the different the six different capitals that that are part of that and maybe that's another strength that we're that our self-awareness is also one that we can recognize in ourselves celebrate for ourselves and then also recognize in the familia in the community in our moms in our abuelas in our tias in all of the folks around us and it's kind of nice to have to see that you know there's something here that maybe other people don't think it's important, but we do, and we see the the, the payoff for it. That's all I wanted to say. With that, if it's okay, Rebecca, I know we're pretty much at time, but I just want to um, just share um, our collective dedication, which I think a lot like is a perfect way to close out our panel. Um, so our collective dedication is this. Um, this book is dedicated a todas las Latinas luchadoras who have led, are leading, and will lead schools, districts, and comunidades in este país y por todo el mundo. We see you. Tu corazón, tu esfuerzos, tu esperanza. We support you. We stand with you. Que Dios las bendiga siempre. We hope we have done your life's work justice through this book. Este triunfo de amor. Ah, beautiful. I could. Con todo corazón. Thank you so much, everybody. So, 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 so grateful for your time and just your brilliance, frankly. And grateful that you're doing this work. Thank you. A huge thank you to all of our panelists today. So thank you to Anna and to Fabiola and to Rebecca and Sylvia and Melissa and to Jackie for providing some great questions. Uh, um, you are all luchadores and I am grateful that you shared your collective wisdom and individual wisdom with us today as a group.